Hello, my name is Andriani Loizidou. I'm the editor-in-chief of Four Eye Magazine, and I have with me today Matthew George, who is the CEO and founder of uh, VG Trust and the author of the Cyber Elephant in the Boardroom, Cyber Account Accountability with the Five Pillars of Security Framework. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. So my first question to you, Matthew, is can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got involved in cybersecurity? Yes, yeah, so I've been in cybersecurity for about 22 years. Uh, prior to uh, starting in cyber, I was in uh, project management, and I actually didn't study uh, engineering or software. My, my studies are um, known as applied languages, which is essentially uh, three or four languages, a little bit of sales and marketing, and a little bit of legal background. And I am a graduate from um, University of Tours in France and the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland. Um, so when I started in, in security back in 99, um, I essentially was selling cyber, well, network security solutions like firewalls, antivirus, uh, IDS, IPS. Um, and then I started uh, thinking about the idea of selling data privacy training. So I started my own business in 2003. And uh, the company VG Trust is now nearly 20 years old. And the first 15 years, we were security assessors, trainers, um, and consultants around, around uh, network security, cyber security, data privacy. Um, and then about four and a half years ago, we pivoted into software. So today we are a software provider for governance risk compliance and integrated risk management solutions. Mm -hmm. How did the idea of the cyber elephant in the boardroom come? So I, I, through the work that I've done in, in consulting, I've, uh, I've been lucky enough that I, I got exposed to loads of different challenges that companies had with regards to cyber security and data privacy and mm -hmm. you know uh, some of the challenges are owing to the threat vectors and the attacks and you know malicious actors whether they're internal or external but a lot of the time uh, the the main issue was around getting the budget and getting somebody to sponsor the project and to follow through with projects at board level. Um, and so I realized um, maybe 12, 13 years ago that if you wanted to have a good security program, of course you needed a, a, a CISO, you needed compliance people, you needed technical solutions training and so on, but you needed to have an ally in the boardroom. And mm -hmm. cyber is really the elephant in the boardroom. Nobody wants to talk about it. Um, now that said, you know, I, I, I really don't agree with people that say that the board doesn't understand risks. The board mm -hmm. deals with risks every day. Um, you know, financial, HR, political, uh, employment, whatever. Um, it's just that the cyber risk is not presented to them in, in business terms that they can understand. So if you go to the board of directors and you start talking about PCI, HIPAA, GDPR, you lose them at the second letter. You know, and, and the reason for that is not that they're not able to understand. It's that it's not necessarily on their radar screen. Yes, they've heard about hacks, they've heard about data privacy and so on, but they, they you know, they're not uh, security experts and we just need to be able to translate the, the cyber security challenges and the compliance challenges into business issues. Uh, that they can they can identify with, and so the, the the purpose of the book is really to educate the board and C level um, as to the importance of cyber accountability. That's why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Can you give us one or two examples of security vulnerabilities posing a daily existential threat to businesses? Um, so let, let's take a non technical one first. Mm -hmm. um, because there are technical vulnerabilities and non-technical vulnerabilities. So a non-technical one is um, lack of training for users and lack of user, of user based training. 
So within your organization, you've got technical people, legal people, HR, sales, marketing, whatever. They don't all need, all need the same cybersecurity training, but you need to have a baseline where they all get trained on the same level of, of, of topics and, and, and they understand the policies and procedures. And then based on their different roles, um, they get additional training. So maybe if you, uh, if you work in management, you get training on cybersecurity challenges during merger and acquisition process. Um, maybe if you're technical, you get trained on vulnerability management or IDS, IPS, encryption, whatever. Um, if you work in sales and you interact with point of sale devices, well, you need to get trained on PCI. If you, if you manage um, uh, PHI, so protected health information, you then need to be trained on HIPAA or NHS guidelines or whatever applies in your, in your uh, jurisdiction. Um, and, and with regards to training, one of the issues, one of the key vulnerabilities is that most organizations only provide training when they have to. Uh, so in other words, the regulator or the enforcement body will say, you need to train your, your staff once a year. So they provide people with training, they tick the box, but I mean, a year is a long time in, in security uh, talk, you know, um, the threat vectors evolve all the time. And so it, it's not enough. You need to have continuous training uh, on an ongoing basis. Now, if I look at a, a technical vulnerability, um, I, I think COVID is a great example. Uh, we went from having maybe 10% of staff working from home to 100% in some cases. And so we also let people use their own devices to connect to uh, business systems that we would have never dreamt of opening up before COVID. The, the, the priority was to survive. It wasn't to, um, you know, it wasn't to, uh, to be secure or compliant. Now, fast forward 18 months to 21 months after all of that, um, we end up with people still using uh, personal devices to conduct business. Mm -hmm. We also have a number of organizations that have replaced those devices with company devices and they're trying to do the right thing, but there's 18 months of data and transactions that was done the wrong way, potentially. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the vulnerabilities that, that we need to look at at the moment is how do we get back on track? How do we get back to the right level? Okay. And you're mentioning on your website that you noticed a troubling trend what was that and what made you address it? I'm sorry, that which is a tr uh, troubling trend? You mentioned, you mentioned on the website that you noticed a troubling trend. What was that and how did you address it? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's a number of troubling trends actually uh, okay. at the moment. Um, I, I mean, the... the, the um, I, I try and keep my finger on the pulse uh, by mm -hmm. reading on cybersecurity every day, but I'm also blessed that I run uh, the VG Trust Global Advisory Board, which is a, a non-commercial think tank with 850 members from 32 mm -hmm. countries at the moment. Um, and they are generally speaking uh, directors, uh, C-level folks, uh, law enforcement like FBI, Interpol, French police, Irish police, um, uh, UK police, academia and independent subject matter experts in compliance and security. And so I look at a lot of trends that are uh, going, uh, uh, going on at the moment. One of the things that worries me and that I talk about uh, a lot is uh, the fact that the, uh, the attacks on critical infrastructure um, like hospitals or banks or government are becoming more personal in terms of consequences. And let me explain that. Um, if I look at colonial pipeline, you're looking at energy. So mm -hmm. the big company that's being um, held to ransom, they decided to pay. I would never advise to pay, but they made um, uh, a calculated decision that they would pay. And but at the end of the day, who, who suffered uh, in, in between whilst they couldn't actually deliver their service? Well, mm -hmm. it, it was you and I, because 
no access to energy or energy prices going up. You look mm -hmm. at the health service executive in the in in, in Ireland. Um, you know, he is a case of a government that uh, didn't make sure that their hospitals and their health service was actually secured the right way. But mm -hmm. to their credit, they refused to pay the ransom and they led by example. But at the end of the day, uh, for about six to eight months, uh, the, the general public in Ireland could not, I mean, they were back to pen and paper. And I'm, I'm, you know, VG Trust is based in Ireland. So a good number of our uh, team uh, members are, are there. And it, you know, uh, you had appointments being canceled, you had health records not being available and all of that bad stuff. So that, that, that's, um, that's the trend. I think the, the other trend that we're seeing and that, that, that is worrying right now is as a result of Russia invading Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. we're seeing a rise in ransomware and we're seeing a lot more attacks coming from Russia. Now, to, again, to be fair, there's a lot of attacks coming into Russia from Ukraine, but you would expect that at this stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think it can be easy for C-level executives and board members to address risk? I mean, as I said earlier on, I think boards deal with risk all the time. Our job as security and compliance people is to demystify the cyber risk for them so that they can deal with that cyber risk the same way as they deal with any other risk. How do you deal with risks? Now, there's only three or four things you can do with risk, whether it's cyber or not. You can ignore the risk, don't do that. You can try and transfer the risk operationally so you get a third party that you trust and they deal with that risk for you. You can offset part of the risk by taking insurance. In, in the case of cybersecurity, it would be cyber liability insurance. Um, or you can try and reduce the risk to a level that you you are comfortable with and even if you're not comfortable with there might be some actors third parties you need to deal with and you have no choice and you make an informed decision to to deal with that risk it's the same with cyber you know you look at um uh, the way uh, the way security and compliance professionals look at cyber risk or compliance risk is we have a look at assets, whether they're tangible, intangible. So it might be data, it might be a server, it might be a cloud provider, an application, whatever. We group those assets into a scope. We look at the various risks that apply to that type of scope uh, based on regulation like um, uh, 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 GDPR or standards like PCI or whatever. And then we say, okay, well, here are all the control points we're supposed to have. Are we able to meet them or not? And if we're not, how do we get to an acceptable level of risk? And then what's the likelihood of the risk of the, the vulnerability being um, exploited? What would be the potential impact? And what's the balance of convenience with the resi residual risk? Um, and so it, it, when you look at financial risk, it's a little bit the same way, but it's not necessarily as granular, depending on what you do. Our job is to tell the board that they're managing assets the same way as when they'd be managing a financial asset or a property asset or whatever. And so if we talk to them in those terms, we, we have a much better chance to get their, their attention. The other thing we need to do is we need to quantify the risk from a financial perspective. If you manage to translate cyber risk into cyber assets that have a value for the company that can be actually included in the assets of the company, suddenly you don't just have costs, but you also have assets to balance those costs. And because you've got those assets on your financial statements, they have to be looked at by the board every time they meet up. So mm -hmm. it's not incorporated into an IT budget or an operations budget. It's a, an, an actual cyber asset and cyber budget. And then mm -hmm. finally, I think that we, we need to be aware of the fact that the board, generally speaking, goes through what I call the five stages of cyber grief. Um, and those stages are denial. So they'll say, it's not our problem. Our problem is to grow the business, to generate profits for shareholders, 
to create employment, to pay tax and so on, I go and talk to someone else. Then comes the anger. We've given you money to recruit a CISO, a compliance officer, to buy firewalls, um, to train people. Go and talk to the technical team, they'll sort you out. Then comes the bargaining stage. Okay, well, I can see that my uh, competitors are, are being hacked or the, the regulator is knocking at their door. So I'm going to hire a very reputable firm to come in and do a security assessment, uh, create a roadmap for me that's me off the hook. And, and it, you're not off the hook. It's a good start, but you're not off the hook. Then comes depression. Oh my God, we have been hacked. The regulator is in the lobby and they're demanding to see us, the board. Not mm -hmm. just so. And then eventually comes the acceptance. And the acceptance is it's not rocket science. You know, it's it's looking at it's looking at risk with um, obviously with a cyber perspective, but at the end of the day, it's just managing another business risk. Mm -hmm. So these are the five pillars that you're talking in in your book, right? So, no, these are the, the five stages of, of cybersecurity grief. The, the five pillars are actually the answer, the solution to that. Okay. Um, and it's based on the idea that whether you look at, say, PCI, GDPR, CCPA, NIS, NIS, whatever, uh, NIS2 now, um, you, you can, you can uh, dial back to five common denominators in those regulations and standards. Physical security, people security, data security, infrastructure security, which is your wider infrastructure. So your remote workers, your hybrid workforce, your subsidiaries, your um, franchises, applications, cloud, third parties, fourth parties, and so on. And then crisis management, what do you do when something goes wrong? So mm -hmm. with us, I've created the five pillars of security framework with two versions. One that is super strategic for the board and one that is strategic for C-level folks. Um, the super strategic one has a, a, a questionnaire attached to it with 25 questions, five questions per pillar. And the strategic one has 60 questions, so 12 questions per pillar. And the questions are asked in plain business English. Um, and the answers to the questions are yes, absolutely. Yes, I think so. No, I don't think so, absolutely not. It's not my problem. I don't care, or it's not applicable. And you'd be surprised how many people say, it's not my problem, I don't care. Okay. I mean, you know, it gives you a maturity level that you can use to map out the progress that you're making with your cybersecurity strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Sorry to cut across you. It, it's available in the public domain. Uh, we make it available on vigitrust.com and actually we it, it's available for free for C-level executives on, on our, on our uh, platform, VG1. So we're not like, what we're trying to do is we're trying to raise the level of awareness at board level, because I truly believe that whether it's government or the board, if you don't have the right allies at the key decision-making layer, it, it, will, it won't filter down through the stacks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, to close the interview, can you read a line or two of your favorite part of the book? Do you have a favorite part that um, you would like to share with us? So there's a part in the book where I say that security is a journey and not a destination. And I really like that part because for me, it's a summary of the challenges and the solutions that, that for, for the problem that we have with all those threats and how we, we address them, whether it's security or regulatory or, or, or any type of other uh, threat that we need to deal with. Um, you, you can get compliant with as many regulations and standards as you want. It doesn't necessarily make you secure uh, and vice versa. You can be fully secure and yet not compliant because there's some you, you secure your data but not in the way that the regulator wants you to do it um, at the end of the day it's a moving target and the reason why it's a moving target is because if you if you look at uh, your business today and you look at your business in two weeks time the threat vectors will have changed somebody will have lost a laptop new users will have been set up uh, people will, will have left and maybe you didn't disable their accounts and so on and so on. So you can never rest on your laurels. 
it's a continuous compliance, continuous journey. So you get a few pit stops along the way where you can say, hey, today I've achieved compliance with PCI, great. Today I was audited by the data protection supervision authority in the country where I'm in, and they gave me thumbs up, that's great. But tomorrow you're opening up a new line of business, you're taking new data, are you taking the same data, are you using the same data for a secondary purpose, you need to do your business impact assessment again. So you can never really stop. Um, and I, I, sometimes some people think, well, this is not a great message because it's not really encouraging. But the reality is that it is encouraging because if you do it the right way, you can automate most of it. And it means that you're always on top of the data and the systems that you're protecting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, another, uh, I, another, I suppose, part of the book that I really like is that uh, I have 10 guest chapters that have been written by members of the advisory board and mm -hmm. they come from the banking industry, the IoT industry, the training side, and they provide their own view as to why the five pillars can help. Um, and the consensus is that it's such an easy to understand model in plain English, um, in my case with a French accent, but never mind. And uh, we, anybody can understand it. You know, anybody can explain it. And um, I, I think that's, a, that's, that's also a positive message. It's not rocket science. Anybody can do it. Okay. So thank you very much for today. It was a pleasure and uh, good luck with everything. I hope I will have you a guest again in the future. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm always available to answer questions or to take part. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye -bye. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>